up everyone? Okay, thank you for joining me on the first video of the Millennial Survival Guide series. Um, this is Saving and Investing Part 1. So, if first of all, thank you for taking your time. You made a really good decision. I mean, you paid a small price for some information that's going to change your life. So, I hope you take this seriously. And if you do, and, and if you apply it over the long term, you're going to thank me and you're going to... And you're gonna, um, build a strong foundation for your financial future. And so, you know, historically everyone, you know, we've always been taught to save, 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 save. And then people talk about investments, but there's so many different opportunities. How do you know what to do, right? Like, how do you know what to invest in? How do you know what to, what to buy? How do you know what to, you know, how to actually build, uh, you know, your nest egg. And in, <clears throat> In the millionaire mind intensive, they, you, there, there's, there's a concept called the jars. <clears throat> so they have seven jars. It's the seven different ways to break up your income. As soon as you get money, you should break it up in these seven ways. So I'll, go, I'll get into the mechanics of what to do with your money. But first, <clears throat> I would recommend adapting that system to, to you. You can look it up. I'll go into detail here, but you can look it up. It's called the jars, <clears throat> the seven jars from the millionaire mind intensive. So what it is, is basically says that your first 55% of your income you use for your necessities, like your rent, your car, your insurance. Um, and it's important to know that, you know, you are going to pay these things and you're always going to pay them and you're always going to have to pay them, right? So whether you're a millionaire or whether you're broke, you have to pay, you have to have a car. I mean, if you have a job or if you have a, a way of getting income that requires you to have a car or, um, and if not, that's great. I mean, that's a good way to save on expenses. No car, no car insurance, uh, no gas, no maintenance. A car is the biggest expense that you're going to have and it's the biggest liability expense, meaning it really doesn't produce anything for you other than a means to maybe get to your job or something. But, um, so First 55% of your income to necessities, uh, realize that your car payment, your insurance, your maintenance, you know, have money set aside for those because they're going to hit you, you know. So if you prepare, the more prepared you are for your expenses, the less it's going to hurt you when they come. You know, the worst thing you can do is not prepare and then just be paying out money whenever expenses hit because you have no organization and, and order over your money. And so, you know, uh, money flows to those who have the most order and organization. So 55% to your necessities. Uh, I think it was then 10% to savings, which is 5% long-term savings and 5% short-term savings, and they have different connotations. I really request that you look it up because I'm the, the video is not about this, but I want to give you a little bit of um, information on it. Then you've got 5% to charity, and I think 20% uh, to your long-term nest egg, your financial freedom account. 55, 75, 85, 90, yep. Uh, there might be another breakout of that, but that's the, that's kind of the, that's the setup that I use. That's less than seven. So I think there is a different breakout, but I personally put, um, I, so that, that's a really a total allocation of about 30% of your income to savings and investments. So you have some in cash cause you need cash reserves. You always have to have cash reserves. Um, and then you have the other 20% in your financial freedom account. So, but the question is, what do you do it and how do you, how do you save and what's the best way to do it? And if you talk to a good financial advisor, they will tell you that you have to take advantage of your pre-tax savings. Now, it's different from waiting until you get the money from your paycheck and putting that money away. Okay, that's not the best way to do it because you're already paying tax on the money. Now, you can have a 401k an IRA or a Roth IRA, I have both. Um, you want to have, if you can, have both. Find a way to have both, or if not all three. Um, but you have, there are contribution limits, so you can only contribute so much to your 401k. I think it's about 18000 some a year. Okay, but that's pre-tax, which means that it, you're able to, so here's the long-term vision of that. You put that money away pre-tax, and you're able to earn 
uh, dividends and uh, payouts and percentage and income on it. And, you know, this is money, so it's a bigger percentage. It's 25, I think it's almost 25% more income that you're able to earn investment income on rather than receiving that income and then putting it in a fund and trying to buy stocks or invest it somewhere, right? So, um, so you have a 25% advantage of your capital, which you're compound investing with, and that makes a massive difference. So you should have cash savings and you should do it automatically. You should have an automatic, uh, either pull that money out automatically, have an automatic uh, withdraw from your checking the savings. Do that first, okay? That's the first thing you need to do because then you realize that money goes away, but you still have it, but you that's a sacred account. These are sacred accounts. Your, your financial freedom account, your 401ks, your uh, savings account. Those are, those are sacred accounts. You don't touch them unless you're moving money for uh, like an investment or a big purchase or something. You just, you just leave them alone. Okay. And they'll continue to, they'll continue to grow. Now, when it comes to actually buying stocks, I mean, if you have a 401k or you have a IRA or something, there's always options. You can buy their 2050 plan. Say you want to retire and, you know, you plan to retire in 2050 or whatever, and they'll self-manage the funds. They'll self-manage the, uh, the investments that go into it. And that's fine. You can do that. If you want to buy your own stocks, always buy dividend stocks. Look at your dividend ratio. Look at how much uh, return you're going to get. And, you know, as Warren Buffett said, if you're going to invest in stocks, buy dividend stocks. You know, buy dividend stocks. I mean, why, why would you? I mean, why would you buy a stock for capital appreciation when you know there's going to be capital appreciation and there will be depreciation? The stock will go up and down, okay? If you buy a dividend stock, it's going to pay you every month or every year, and you're going to compound it as you hold the stock. Now, the other thing in picking stocks, if you're buying your own stocks, pick a company that has a good reputation. Look at the look at the profit margin. It doesn't always matter, but it'll give you a good indication of you know, how stable the company is. Um, so there is a lot that goes into analyzing the companies that you want to buy. Also think about the, the products that they sell and the future that there is in their company or their industry. Um, you know, but dividend stocks, th th that dividend is your key because that's your compounding income. Um, so there is a lot of misconceptions about saving and you thinking, you know, look, these, these things aren't going to make you rich. But over time, if you apply uh, compounding income, compounding interest, and compounding dividends in your investing, and you realize that you save, if you're able to pull money out and save before you have your chunk of cash that you're going to spend, and you do this before, like immediately, before or immediately upon getting any income that you get, then you know, you you start to realize, A, you don't miss the money because you're probably wasting it on stuff you don't need anyways. And then B, you're actually being forced to be better at managing how you spend your money. And if you manage how you spend your money, then you're in a lot better control. You're in a lot more control. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, these are, these are, these are fundamentals. These are fundamentals. Okay. The other thing is um, David Bach. He, he wrote The Automatic Millionaire. That's a good book. I suggest you read it. Uh, he talks about the latte factor, right? You get that five, six dollar latte every day. You know, that, that comes out to be, I think it was about $10,000 in a year. In a year or in a decade. I don't know. I'm, it's early, so I'm not, my, my brain is not uh, calculating math very efficiently right now. But it's a lot of money, okay? So even if you have to buy coffee, get the $2 coffee, you know? Get the drip coffee. You'll learn to like it better anyways. It's, it is better. Uh, it's better for you too. Um, and, and, you know, if you can, just stop drinking coffee because it, it's not good for you. It robs you of your energy. It's addictive. It's extremely addictive. It's incredibly addictive. And I know it tastes good. I like it too, but I had to quit it because it, 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 it just starts to take over. So <clears throat> have an opportunity mindset, 
Okay, because there's opportunity everywhere. But be be aware of the difference. Understand the difference between a securitized investment and say uh, forex or the get rich quick scheme or the MLM, right? The business opportunity that you that your friend posts on Facebook or something. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> you, you probably won't make money unless you're really good at sales, you're really good at recruiting people, and you're, or you're really good at marketing. In which case, you should do that if you know you can generate income. But don't spend money <clears throat> uh, speculatively. It is the worst thing you can do, especially when you're investing, when you're dealing with your nest egg and you're dealing with your capital. That's not speculative. That's not speculative capital. You should never speculate with it. Um, you should invest it in things that are tried and true, solid. The, div the dividend side, I'm just going to keep saying it. The dividend stocks are where you need to put your money. Um, but not all stocks, because right now we're in a bubble. We're in a total bubble, and <clears throat> there's a lot of dividend stocks that I would personally like to buy, but I'm not going to buy it because I know that they're going to go down with, with the crash. You know, There's a cyclical. There's always a, a rise and fall. It's cyclical. There are some other companies, however, um, where I think they're undervalued or they're, they're valued at a, at a good price. A position and they pay a good dividend and it would be a good buy so analyze based on the market too you have to analyze your purchases based on the market if you're not if you're not investing yourself or if you're just um, you know gonna put it into an account and let a mutual fund manage it or go off of you know a managed fund that's fine you don't have to worry about it but I'm talking about for those of you who want to buy stocks and who are interested in investing and, and managing your own capital the, that's my recommendation. <clears throat> so <clears throat> you always need to make sure that you're paying yourself first. That's the concept. Pay yourself first. You're paying yourself first pre-tax in your in your savings retirement account. Um, and the nice thing is, if you're self-employed, if you're self-employed, you can put even more capital. There's no, the, your cap is much smaller. It's a percentage, or, or it's 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 much bigger. Meaning you can put away a lot more capital. So if you make a, if you're self-employed and you make a million dollars in a year, I think you can put away, I think the cap is maybe fifty thousand or something in that year. But you can put away fifty thousand pre-tax. So you can literally pay yourself before you're taxed, and then you can invest that money wherever you want in the stock market or in a mutual fund or something. Now, there's all sorts of uh, different investment vehicles. What we can maybe, I think we'll get into that in a different video. Um, you know, such as your options and your um, stock, uh, bonds and your, I don't know, CDs and stuff like that. Um, you know, I'm not a financial advisor or any sort of, you know, financial representative. So um, keep in mind that this is just, this is just uh, my coaching to you about you know what I've done and and what's helped me so the key is pay yourself first you want to put that tax tax free money away and then you want to pay yourself you know put it in your savings account right and if you have another checking account put a put a maybe a, a fun account or something like that I think that was one of the other buckets too look that up this the jars the seven jars uh, money system it's called the jars money system um, just because they uh, they have a bunch of jars that they set out and they put the money in it um, based on percentage. But that's the key. Pay yourself first. Um, An automatic. I mean, your insurance company understands it. Um, there's a bunch of other payments that you probably make that understand it. They, you, they the, the payment is automatic. It's recurring. You don't really, you set it up once and the money goes away out of your spending account into a sacred account. Okay, this is really, really crucial because, um, you know, if you don't touch the money, if you can't get to it, or if you have an agreement that you're not going to touch it, it's there. It's sacred. Um, let's talk about credit cards, okay, and credit. Because there's, I'm going to do a whole video on credit cards and credit. You'll see this. Um, but pay it every month. And find a good credit card that has a good reward system and then use all your necessity spending or whatever on your credit card but pay it off within 30 days or whatever your time frame is so you don't pay any interest 
Okay, the inter even even one month of interest is is a total rip off. Don't do it. <clears throat> but find a good reward system because after you spend so much, maybe they'll send you a check. I just got a check from Wells Fargo because I use their credit card and pay it off every month. Uh, so it's free money just for using their card instead of your own cash. Uh, as long as you pay on time and it'll help build your credit. So um, let's talk about non-conventional investments. Uh, the other thing is your, your home or like your primary residence is really not an investment. If you don't have one, I would recommend buying one. And believe me, there are ways you can do it no matter what you what you can afford or what your income is unless you're unemployed as long as you're employed and have two years employment history talk to your bank or call a mortgage broker um, <clears throat> there's an FHA loan you can get a first-time home buyer's assistant which means that you only have to put three and a half percent to five percent down on your property and now you can buy a condo too condos are cheap too so you can buy it you can afford it doesn't matter what you make you can afford something to buy something that has some sort of value appreciation and then have some equity, okay? If you build equity, then you have the ability to actually get move up out of your situation into maybe another level, but it takes time and it depends on where the market's at because you can lose money in real estate too. So, um, you know, depending on where you live and, and, and what the market's like, you know, uh, look into that. I mean, consider buying something and, and look for something that maybe needs a little bit of work. And, and you know, the general rule of thumb of there there is maybe the cheapest house or the the worst house in the best neighborhood. Um, that's the general rule of thumb uh, for investing. Uh, there's a lot of things you got to look for and look out for when you're buying property. As far as um, there's so much to be aware of. I mean, if it's a condo, you have to look at you know is it top floor, bottom floor? Do you have people above you? Is there noise? Um, you know what hindrances, what other hindrances are there in, in reselling it? Is it does it back up to a major road? Are there power lines? You have to you have to think about all those things uh, on top of the location when you're buying property, and um, you know. But the nice thing is, if you have a little bit of cash, and there's even some places here in in certain cities, if you want to buy in certain cities, you can get a grant. Uh, and the city will actually pay you. They'll pay your down payment, so you can buy a house if you make under a certain amount. I think it's under eighty-five thousand a year. You can get uh, down payment assistance, where they'll pay your down payment. You don't have to repay it, and zero percent down. You just bought a house, and then you have equity plus that equity from that down payment that was put into it. So. Um, those are main investments. The reason that's uh, people consider that investment is because it's a tax write-off. You get a big tax write-off from it. Now, your uh, primary residence isn't really an investment unless you know there's a significant amount of equity in it and you can sell it and you have a way to sell it uh, once that equity is built up, but it's really not. So if you can, use that uh, FHA, uh, get a loan, and buy, find a duplex or a, or a threeplex or a fourplex. You can get up to uh, four units will still be considered residential under FHA. And then you could have income coming in on your property. So that, that would be an investment. Um, your primary residence, not so much. Maybe there's some equity, but it's not a, really a solid investment. Um, it is a solid investment, but it's not really a guarantee on a, on a high return. So... Um, so that's the key. Always pay yourself first. Uh, if you're going to buy stocks, buy dividend stocks. Let them compound. Don't buy anything that's overinflated or overvalued with the market. Check the markets. Make sure you know where things are at in the market. And, you know, maybe I'll do some uh, analysis on some, on some stock charts at some point. But uh, thanks for watching. I hope this was valuable to you. And we'll see you in the next round.